The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. You're back in the House of Mystery and we are talking turkey today. So <laughs> on the interview, we have an author that's uh, written about his experience, um, you might say, and we'll get right into it. So we're talking about uh, the book Turkey Street, and uh, Jack and Liam moved to a Bodrum. Uh, Jack, Scott, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Yeah. So now... Um, Let's let's talk about your your writing. There was two two books, I believe. Um, yes, indeed. What what brought you to um, actually write and share your experience? What what was it that uh, made you do? Oh, okay. Um, well, we when we moved to Turkey, Turkey, um, which is some a few years ago now, we moved there in two thousand and eight. Um, the end the end of two thousand and eight. Um, we kind of semi-retired, or at least we retired early, ridiculously early, really, from a, a couple of very busy lives in London with busy jobs, and um, and we decided to give it all up. And then uh, we moved to Turkey, and um, it, it it was fantastic. It was a wonderful place, and we, we we rented a wonderful house that overlooked the Aegean Sea, and you know we had the most glorious sunsets. But after about six months, months we got a bit bored looking at the sunsets, as, go as gorgeous and as wonderful as they were. Um, and so um, w one lesson that we learned about living uh, overseas is that a lot of people, a lot of ex expats, see, see it as, uh, or co focus on the journey rather than the destination. So they see it as, it as, I want to go and live in the sun. So they make plans to go and live in the sun and it's a fantastic thing they do. But when they get there, they haven't really thought about what they're going to they're do. And everybody needs an occupation. Everybody needs something to do, something to get out of bed for in the morning. And we did get a bit bored, bored so, so we didn't have an occupation. So a friend of mine said to me, well, lots of interesting things were happening around us. We met lots of interesting people. Um, why don't you start blogging? blogging? So I'd never blogged before. I'd never really thought about it. And uh, so I, but I did. I started to blog. Um, and almost overnight, the blog became instantly popular. I don't know why. You know, I, even to this day, I can't, I can't understand why pe people were possibly interested in my random ramblings about our lives in Turkey. But uh, in a period of about four or five months, it became the most popular English language blog in Turkey um, of its type. Obviously, there are more popular blogs blogs around things like travel and, um, uh, and archaeology because uh, Turkey is a great place for, for that sort of thing um, but in terms of a kind of, a kind of gossipy uh, narrative of life in Turkey it became extraordinarily popular so um, I was a, I was approached by a publisher who thought that I might, there might be a book in it hmm. uh, so okay I thought oh, oh I never even thought about that why not so I started writing it and um, uh, the first book which was called Perking the Pansies, which mirrored the the name of the blog, um, was published in, uh, in the end of 2009 and did very, very well. Um, so that's kind of how I got to write the book um, about our time there. Um, it, was, it was an interesting time, uh, interesting for us. A lot of the, the theme really was because we were a gay couple, we'd recently married in, in, in London. And we, in effect, emigrated to what is a Muslim country, a Muslim majority country, and a lot of people were interested in that kind of angle. What, what were we were doing there? How would people respond to us? How people, how would people react? Um, and you know, I kind of wrote a little bit about that, about that too. Um, I tried to keep it light and frothy, but there was also some interesting things that came out as we lived there too. So right. That's kind of how it got there. Well, 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 first of all, what brought you to Turkey? Like, why did you guys go there? Uh, purely practical reasons. I've been travelling to Turkey for um, a, no a number of years on holiday, um, so I knew the country reasonably well, but only as a tourist. And I'm a little, a little bit of a history buff, and I do like ancient history. And of course, in Turkey, there's a kind of ancient sites on every hill. Every hill, you know, it's, 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 it's the place is littered with ancient cities. Um, uh, so I've always been attracted to it, and so I knew about. Out, uh, Turkey. I knew a little bit about its history. I knew about its people. I knew, even though it's a Muslim country, it's a secular Muslim country. So, uh, and, and for example, homosexuality um, is is not even mentioned in the Turkish Penal Code. It's not Saudi Arabia. It's not Iran. It's completely different. Um, and I liked it very much. And we actually also had our honeymoon there. So we spent uh, two wonderful weeks 
weeks mm. on honeymoon there. And I, I've been there with previous partners and, and never had a, 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 a difficult time or a, 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 or, or a poor response from the people around us. People are always delightful. That was one of the reasons. Another reason was we only had so, had so much money to spend, spend and, and Turkey was at the time a relatively cheap destination. Yeah. Um, so we knew we could live there on with the on the funds that we had. Um, weren't you worried about going to a Muslim country, being that uh, you know being a gay couple um, is not exactly uh, appropriate for them in in the Muslim religion? It's not. But as a secular a secular country, we were protected um, under the law and. And uh, there is a great tradition amongst Muslim countries or, or Islamic religion of hospitality. hospitality. So, so, and also, uh, Turkey is one of the major destinations for British tourists. Uh, and we uh, we didn't go to a remote area of Turkey. We went to Bodrum, which is a very Western-leaning, very Western uh, resort um, on the Aegean. So we knew what we were doing. Um, I have to say, uh, ironically, I suppose the the only bad vibe we ever got from anybody about us was from our fellow expats, not from the Turks we lived around, or, or they lived around us. And in Bodrum, in fact, we lived in two, place, two places in Turkey. We rented a house in a small resort called Yalakovac near Bodrum, and then after a year we moved into Bodrum town itself. And we lived, um, we rented a house from an uh, elderly uh, Turkish couple. We lived next door and around lots of Turkish people and I can say we never got a bad uh, experience from anyone. Um, we did get respons responses from, from some of the expats, um, maybe because they were a generation above us, maybe because they were conservative um, thinking. Um, so that's the only time we ever felt uncomfortable. Hmm. And, I, and I'd say that with sincerity. It, honestly, the, the Turkish people were open and welcoming to us. But then, of course, we weren't Turkish. Had we been Turkish, it might be a different um, situation. Right. What was the biggest surprise then? What was the what shocked you, or you just didn't expect? I, honestly, I don't think we, I don't think there's anything we didn't expect um, um, at all. In fact, as I said, I, I, I personally been going to Turkey for about fifteen years regularly. Uh, uh, so and, and and we lived in a western part, western leading part of part of Turkey. So there weren't, weren't any surprises in it for me at all, uh, particularly. It was a very easy transition. Wow. Um, so how how did your life change then? Like what was what was different about your life in Turkey? Of course, other than the, you know, the 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 weather and it's not going to rain so much and all that stuff. But um, well. Well, you think, you think, do you? That's just not entirely true. One thing I, I say, it's interesting what you say about what surprised me. That's, I have just thought of something. Nobody ever tells you that the Mediterranean in January isn't that pleasant. <laughs> that is not written in the brochures. No. Uh, um, we had the most enormous storms. Um, and we, in Bodrum in particular, we had r water running, running down the streets uh, and floods and uh, biblical of biblical proportion, proportions, it was extraordinary. I mean, I, you know, I live in, 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 in England. England is known for rain, but nothing prepared us for the rain that was, going, that was going to be coming down in Turkey during January and February. It's a very short winter. It's a short, sharp winter. It's not particularly cold, but it's, all, it's also not particularly warm. And um, Turkish houses aren't really built for cold, um, not like Canadian houses and to a certain extent, extent British houses. So, so there was no heating and heating in the winter, so we had to find different ways in which to stay warm. Um, so that was a bit of shock, to be honest, and, and it just occurred to me after, to me after you asked the question, because, as I say, it's not nothing is written about how, how, it's, how it can be like. Um, uh, we did also, we visited Istanbul while we were there, and and, uh, and it, it snowed, and I wasn't expecting it to snow in Istanbul. Uh, um, so, you know, winters can, winters can be harsh. Yeah. Um, so, but in terms of the way our lives changed, we, I think what we, we had fair, fairly high-powered jobs, I guess, in London, um, we had a, you know we had a career. We both had careers, and uh, and um, we gave all that up. And, and we also gave up the salaries that go with it. Um, so we learned the thing we learned to do is live better with less, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So the quality of our life increased, even though we had much much less in terms of disposable income. Um, and it's easy to do that in Turkey because the cost of living is much lower. Um, 
than it is in, in, in Western Europe. Um, so, uh, and we learned to cook properly. You know, we stopped um, buying convenience food because you can't really buy convenience food. You know, you, right. you have, when you go to the supermarkets, there you go to the markets, you buy fresh vegetables, you buy fresh produce, and you cook from scratch. That's kind of how everybody does it. So we kind of learned to do that. I mean, uh, 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 Liam is my husband. He's quite a good cook anyway, so we kind of knew how to do that. I'm not the best cook in the world. but So you learn to do that, and you learn to slow things down, and you learn to uh, spend more quality time um, on the things that you want to do. Um, and, but I guess we were kind of living on about a quarter of our income right. uh, being used to. And then when we came back to England, we brought that mentality back with us. So we don't have, we didn't go back to work in the same way. And we do work, but it's not the same. Um, and so our salaries are much less. And therefore, you know, we can't, we used to spend lots of money on expensive holidays and what have you. Can't do that anymore. But I think we live better. I think the quality is better. So that's one lesson that we did learn huh. and something that we brought with us. So that was kind of a major change for you. So it kind of made you look at how you lived your life? Yes, I think it did. Absolutely did. You know, it, you know your priorities change. Um, and, um, you know, we uh, not to dwell on it, but we've had some, some, some recent deaths around us in, in the last recent years. And it made us think that, um, you know, we, it could be us, we could be dead tomorrow. Um, so let's kind of live a life that makes us happy. And that isn't always about material things. Yeah, um, yeah. Everybody well. needs the basic minimum. Everybody needs to be able to, you know, heat, light and, and what have you. But, um, and I'm not, I'm not trying to preach poverty here. It's just that it's about slowing down. We were on a really, really bad treadmill in London in the sense it was very fast life. Uh, we, we had both had busy jobs. We were tired all the time, you know. And then we used to spend loads of money on going on expensive holidays, um, and we just don't do that anymore. Yeah. So we go for walks, you know. And we go to the park and have a slow pint, and we have, you know. Huh. So it's yeah. it's actually really changed your life in a way. Absolutely, absolutely. In a way that it, in a way that most people don't get a chance to do. We did it very early, and I think I was I would have been forty nine. 48 felt 49 when we left and um, people don't generally retire at 40, 48 and 49 so uh, we, we got to do it early and we managed to maintain that which is fantastic yeah that's amazing um, what brought you back then to the UK family issues uh, in the main uh, mostly Liam's family his parents were el elderly and both had developed dementia uh, and Liam also had a, um, a profoundly disabled brother um, and things started getting quite difficult uh, for the family so we came back to help. Um, sadly all three of them have now died um, so it's been quite a rough from, from that point of view, it's been quite a rough few, few years but it's, so in a sense we jumped out to Turkey we took, it was a window of opportunity. We grabbed it while we could because we always knew, we always did know that things would, have, would drag us back um, so we, we took the opportunity when we could. Within, within Turkey, now, uh, so how did you find um, gay life? Like, how, how what was the uh, lifestyle like there? Did there was there gay communities, gay clubs, all that, or what? How, try to explain that maybe. Yeah, it, it's not quite. Uh, um, there, there are in, in Istanbul. There are traditional style gay bars and clubs that we would all recognise. Um, but out elsewhere, um, you, you won't really find that. Uh, sexuality can be quite ambiguous in the Muslim world, um, so it, it isn't always obvious. We didn't in, indulge at all. We were very happy being together, so we didn't need a gay scene and we didn't seek one out. We did know some gay people while we were there and made friends with some gay people, but um, it wasn't something that was, was uh, important to us. Um, so there were lots of lots of discreet liaisons going on and some discreet bars. Right. But a but, but a kind of Western gay scene doesn't really exist outside the outside the main cities. So that's not un that uncommon though, even right. in Western countries. I'm sure in Canada there isn't a gay bar in every corner, you know. So um, uh, and certainly um, in, in Britain, you know, uh, it, it's kind of moved on. A bit now, hasn't it? Really, the gay, gay scene isn't quite what it used to be 
because because uh, LGBT um, people in Britain are much more accepted, it, there is in a sense less need for a gay scene. Right, it was um, more more mainstream now in in society. Yes. It, well, I'd say for Canada and Britain, in the states, in certain parts, but not all. Yeah, of course. Um, and the apps, you know, people people meet online yeah, and, and yeah. things like that. So, um, well, I've always always said, you know, primarily when I was younger, you used to go to a gay bar, to, a gay bar to pick up on a Saturday night. Truthfully, I mean, um, yeah. and um, you know, you don't need to do that anymore. So, you know, you, you can do use the apps. It's a lot cheaper. Why spend, you know, Saturday night propping up a bar in the hope of meeting somebody? It's expensive. It's a bit of a faff, isn't it, really? You have to get yeah. there, to get back when you can, you know. Yeah. Uh, so a lot, of, a lot of gay bars in London in particular have closed down because, frankly, people just don't go out like they used to. Right. Um, uh, so, so, but if, if they'd never really had that, did you see a difference in the way that they interact with each other? Well, Muslim Muslim societies are different in the sense that they're fairly pa patriarchal and they're quite male orientated. So you often will see men in Turkey walking down the street hand, holding hands, but that doesn't make them gay, and it doesn't mean they're in a gay relationship. It's a much more subtle uh, society where it's not as obvious, it's not as black and white, it's not as uh, you know as, as simple as that. It's much more nuanced. Um, and so uh, sexuality is a, is a much, much more, um, uh, less defined, or traditionally was less defined in Muslim countries. Um, because traditionally women didn't leave the home. Traditionally they stayed at home. Traditionally there were virgins when they got married. And um, traditionally they were kept away from work, the world of work. So it was a very male, in, or, uh, male environment. And things used to happen there. I guess I've never been involved in it because, yeah. yeah. But well, uh, I mean, you were a virgin at home for a while, weren't you? Or life, it's very different. Different it, it, people think that that, that that it ought to be the same, or they're expecting something which is the same, and it's not the same for me. You know, I, maybe I would have thought that way too. I mean, I came out in the seventies in London. Um, I've always been out, really. I, I was think I was 16 when I first came out, and um, I had a very supportive family, and that was all fine. Um, uh, so, but things were very gay or not gay in those days. Um, when you go to a country where that's much more nuanced and much more um, left, the boundaries are less clear. You have to play the game much in a very different way. Um, and so you could have sex with a man in Turkey and in other Muslim countries too, but they would never say they were gay. And it often in, Mus in, 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 in Muslim countries, it's only the passive partner who's gay anyway. That's the way they see it. Oh. If you're active, you're not gay. Uh, it's a different way of lo looking at it. I'm not defending it. It's, it's weird to me too, because as a seven, you know, as a, a, a seven, 70s boy, um, but. It's a different way of looking at it, and you have to accept that that's the way it is. Otherwise, there's no point being there. It didn't trouble us at all because we, we, we used to have Turkish men that we, we were friends with and we knew were probably gay, but it just never came up in conversation at all because it's not a conversation you have. Huh? So, how did you did you ever feel threatened there? No, no not once, not ever. Um, uh, and you know, Bod 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 Bodrum's a big tourist town. You know, people go to Bodrum from all over, particularly all over Europe. Um, uh, it's very popular with Germans and with Dutch. Uh, and so, um, no, absolutely not. The only problem we had was trying to learn Turkish because living in a tourist town, we did try to learn Turkish. It's a very complex and difficult language to learn, but we did try, but we found that everybody wanted to try their English on us. Right. <laughs> so you want to have a conversation with Turkey in very, very bad, broken call Turkish and they were they were wanting to practice their English on you which is which is interesting really. So our master mastery of the uh, Turkish language was uh, profoundly disappointing. Hmm. You know when you go to a country like Turkey you know and and all the ups and downs countries have were you ever worried about it um, becoming military or becoming having a uh, some sort of catastrophe happening? Oh, all the time. Turkey has a glorious history of military coups. Yeah. If you know anything about Turkish history, um, mostly right-wing um, uh, military coups. And, and at the moment, they have a, a particular um, un, um, nasty piece of work as a president called um, uh, 
Yeah, Erdogan. Yeah. Um, and his party is is kind of conservative Islamist. It's not. It's very different from Iran and Saudi Arabia. We're not talking about you know that kind of extreme form of Islam, but it's a conservative Islam. I kind of see it very much as maybe some uh, equated with American evangelists, right? Um, yeah. Who are quite you know preachy and 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 you know it's all Bible, 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 and the saying it's Quran, Quran, Quran. But um, he has at least respected the Turkish secular um, constitution which was established by Ataturk back in the, um, the 20s and 30s and it's interesting that you know in Britain for example people get married in the church I'm sure that's true in Canada too um, they get married in a church or a, or, or a, or a synagogue or, or, a, or a temple that is completely unacceptable in Turkey under the constitution all marriages are civil Oh. So, so you and in France the same is true. In fact, um, you can't get married in uh, not, not people do tend to get married in mosques, but you can't have a religious ceremony. It's not recognised by the state. That's quite interesting when you think about it. Hmm. Uh, so it's not dominant. Islam isn't dominant in that sense, in the way that it is in the UK when people get married in church, but that's a religious ceremony. Right. So, uh, so, so the religion isn't necessarily what you know. Um, what do you say? Um, gives the um, marriage credence. It's it's more of the no. uh, the law part. The it's the law, and that's actually true in most countries, even in in the UK. And I said it certainly must be true in in Canada too, and 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 the US. Actually, the legal part of getting married in Britain is the signing of the register. Right. Everything else is rubbish. You know, you, it's all dressing up. You know, it's all the words that you can say and what have you. It's all wonderful stuff, and we went through that and we had a fantastic time. But actually, the only legal bit is the signing of the register, um, and that's done. And in a church in this country, it's done in a church, but it's done at the um, uh, permission of the state. So it's not run by the Church of England or whatever church it might be. It is actually the state that says that we're, you're acting as agents of the state, if you like. Um, so. Most people don't realise that. It's the state that controls marriage in most countries. Um, um, and so the religious bit is just dress, all dressing, really. Yeah. Uh, oh. So what, what would you recommend for people um, to do the same thing you did, like to go to somewhere like Turkey and live for a while? Well, I wouldn't necessarily say Turkey now. I mean, I think Turkey has taken a turn, um, right. which is unsure where it's heading. Um, as I said, it's got a glorious history of military coups, and there was an attempted coup in recent years, which failed. Um, and you know, I don't approve of coups. It's whatever you might say about Erdogan, he was democratically elected. You know, yeah. um, and and so you know, his time though will pass. Like these things happen. You know, like Trump, his time will pass. <laughs> Hopefully, uh, yeah. You know, uh, his time will pass, and then things will change. But I wouldn't necessarily recommend Turkey right now. Um, because well, we're in a different world now the ec econ economically because of the pandemic um, who knows what the, the shape of things will be in the future hmm. uh, I would recommend nobody to do anything for the moment <laughs> yeah no no well yeah. did you did you feel like they uh, well did they have fairly decent medical or support oh. there oh absolutely yes yes sorry if you're talking about the practicals uh, uh, Turkey does have a very good state-run medical service, but there is also private medical treatment if you wish, um, if you want to pay for it, and it's very economic, and very um, uh, compared to Western countries. It, it's, it's a steal. I did have my teeth completely redone in Turkey for a, for a very small amount of money compared to what you'd have to pay for in England. Um, but no, the, the state system is, is, is pretty pretty good. It's pretty good. Wow. Well, there you go. I'll, I'll head there now. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, you love it. I mean, they've got a huge tradition of hospitality. Food is fantastic. I mean, Turkish cuisine is one of the four great cuisines of the world. Um, if you're interested in history, the place just oozes it. You know, there are more ancient Greek cities in Turkey than there are in Greece. Um, because, of course, the Greek world expanded. Um, I, Bodrum itself is old Halicarnassus. We lived up the road from one of the, uh, the ancient wonders of the world, which is the mausoleum of Halicarnassus. Um, and so that was up the street from us. 
So we came out of our door, we could walk up the street, and there it was. Not much left, not much to see, it has to be said. Um, but there you are. We lived on the same street as one of the ancient, wonder, uh, uh, ancient wonders of the world. So, so if you're into that kind of thing, and not everybody is, but if you are, it's a fantastic place. Certainly a fantastic place to visit. And, and I would urge people to go because economically they kind of need the money right now. Yeah. Um, they really, really do. And things are really tough. Uh, the lira has taken a, a huge, huge um, hit. Um, when we first went to Turkey, the lira was about three lira to the pound. Now it's eight. So you know the currency has dropped through the floor, and that really, really affects people's people's lives. Yeah, oh yeah, 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 totally. Um, so when when someone reads your book, when someone picks up one of these two books, um, what do you hope that they walk away with? Well, I think I, I hope that they, they, they find it funny. Um, they are fu they're both funny. They're meant to be funny. It, it's, a, it's a kind of jokey thing, uh, but wrapped up in some serious stuff too. I do talk about serious stuff. I think it gives, hopefully it gives people a sense that, um, that with the right attitude, uh, with uh, a, 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 a sense of adventure and an open mind, that uh, gay people, um, particularly to these gay people, um, can live, if you choose well, can live in a place and live very well um, and be accepted. And I think that's what we were. So I'm very grateful for that. Hmm. Really interesting. What do you miss most? Uh, the weather, I, you mentioned earlier, I have to say. You know, um, <laughs> the spring weather is fantastic. The autumn weather is fantastic. The, the summers were very, very hot. And the winters were much colder than I imagined they would be. But yeah, the weather, I think um, the, the outdoor life, the, uh, the food is fantastic. Um, the, the fact is that you can travel because, because of its geographical location, you can travel to Asia really easily, um, which we did a little bit of, um, that you can, uh, the architecture, the history, um, the wonderful ambiance we lived in Bodrum which has got a fantastic ambiance it's a wonderful place to live so I do miss that um, yeah hmm. I think that's it really where do, where do you want to go next <laughs> or are you giving uh, that up we're very happy where we are we live in a very pretty little village um, and you know I'm 60 this year so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of retired really um, and I, I, I really like where we live I mean it's more about travel now um yeah. I say I must make it to Canada. I have relatives in Canada. I've never been to the States a few times, but I've never been to Canada. I must make it to Canada before I die. Well, yeah, it's a it's a good place. It's like yeah. the States, but nice. <laughs> yes, it's, it's the States with with, with health care. Yeah, with health care and people <laughs> smile and and yeah. uh, a lot less violence. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. You know. It's a bit rough in the winter. Well, it depends on where you are, yeah, um, I'm, because I'm, in, in the West we don't really get much winter, so. Um, uh, you know, it rains. Where, where are you exactly? Well, my my main home. I'm in the Kelowna area, so I'm in the desert part of of Canada, which the Sonora Desert runs out of the states up through um, the middle part of BC, British Columbia, in the west. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and uh, it's surrounded by two mountain ranges. So what happens is that desert stays fairly desert, so it's pretty warm and. Um, all the all the wineries are here, and the, and all the fruits oh, okay. grown here. It's all it's kind of like wine country, fruit country. So it's um, sounds uh, wonderful. It is actually, and so uh, winter doesn't really um, affect us here. We don't really um, get much. We do get some rain, of course, and stuff sure, like that. Sure. But it's nothing major, you know. Not I used to work, I used to work with a woman from Vancouver, and she um, she said it rained a lot in Vancouver. Oh yeah, rain. So uh, there, she came to London. She said, "I'm quite at home here. It's fine." Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Vancouver and London are very similar. It rains a lot, it, but they're right in the uh, right on the ocean there, right in the coast. Yeah, yeah, so, sure. you know, a, a lot of rain there. But um, yeah, no, it's a good place. It's a good place overall. It's really good. But um, are you going to write some more, or are you kind of done writing? I'm kind of done, really. And um, what I found that although the books did well, particularly the first book, Perky in the Pansies, did extremely well, and I'm very grateful for that. It's only ca caught the imagination. Um, some fantastic reviews and some really, really positive feedback. Um, 
uh, uh, totally unexpected. You know, I'm I'm a nobody. You know, nobody knows who I am. I, uh, uh, I'm just a guy that lived in Turkey for a while. And the fact that somebody would want to read my 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 camp old nonsense is um, is, is fantastic. Um, but what I found was that although it did very well, it's not going to make money to any large extent. You know, it did well, but um, uh, it, so I ended up ironically working in partnership with my publisher. So now I work with her because we run a small, very not small but niche publisher that that publishes expat-related books, um, and so uh, that's t she came to me and offered me a publishing contract. Uh, it was her company, and then a few couple of years down the road, she understood. I had worked for her. I did a few pieces, bits of piece of work for her. She said, "Would you like to come into partnership with me?" So I did, and now I spend my time. Uh, managing other people's books. <laughs> there you go. So yeah, and I found I found out that it, you know you make more money working with other people than you do in your own stuff. So there you go. Yeah, uh, it can be that way for sure. Yeah. Um, so we publish five to ten books a year, expat related books. Um, some do very well. Some some do not so well. You know. So um, hmm. so I'm constantly proofreading and checking and publishing and um, doing all sorts of stuff on behalf of other authors now. Yeah. And I quite enjoy doing it really. And it keep you know it keeps me out of the pub. So when you when you deal with that, so you're you're focusing on expats. So are we yeah. talking about just travel or are we talking about all No, it's really stuff? about no, it's about the expat experience, about living abroad. Um, so that could be a memoir like my own. So it could be somebody that talks about um, where they live. So, for example, we have a couple of titles, which is about living in Spain. Uh, we have another title, a uh, very popular, very popular title about living in the Dominican Republic. Um, so, on the, so it could be a memoir about people's experiences of the expat world, but it also could be something a bit more academic. It could be around what's called the culture kids, which is the experience of children growing up in um, in uh, cultures which are not their own or countries in which their parents weren't born. Um, that typically might be a, a, somebody who works for Shell, for example, and who has children and then has assignments all over the world. Children in various international schools along the way. Um, it could be about that experience. That can be quite alienating for, 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 for younger people. So we have quite a, a few a titles that, that look at that issue and examine that issue. Um, or it could be travel. So, you know, one of our most popular books is about, um, you know, uh, moving to, to Catalonia in Spain. And, and it's called a travel log kind of thing. So anything that, 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 that is, is related to the expat experience and travel too um, is something that we're interested in publishing. Hmm. So what's uh, okay? Let's give your website now. What's the website for you, or do you have one, or maybe your publisher? I do. Publisher? I have my website is for my own books is jackscott.info. Um, uh, but our publishing company is summertimepublishing.com. Wow. Well, that's fantastic. What I'll do is I'll make sure that's put up on our website. Uh, people listening can just click and find you. Thank and, you. And if they want to send you a, a good note, that's great. Um, <laughs> our, our guest has been Jack Scott for the interview and we're talking about Turkey Street we're talking about his two books and publishing thank you for being here Jack thank you, thank you very much you've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show to find out more about our guests hosts or shows go to www.houseofmystery.com show is over for now was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.